All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, Today, we're joined by a brand new guest. Uh, Her name is Elaine Pagels, and she's best known for uh, books like the Gnostic Gospels, uh, Beyond Belief, Why Religion, Reading Judas, and so many more. And so, Elaine, uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm super excited to talk with you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, Glenn. Thank you. So I have all of your books um, in front of me on my shelf. We're going to need an Elaine Pagel shelf. Uh, pretty soon for all of your books, but I'm going to try to direct my questions to uh, three main areas. So number one, uh, the Gnostics. Number two, uh, the Gnostic scriptures, in particular, the Gospel of Judas, because that's super new to me. And then lastly, number three, I have a little bit more of a personal question for you um, after reading, I guess, my, my late night reading through your, through your memoir, uh, Why Religion?, and we obviously could spend, I don't know, 50 episodes doing all of those different questions, but we'll see how deeply we can drill down in the time that we have. Um, but first, though, maybe for our listeners who aren't too familiar with you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and who are you and what do you do? Uh, a general intro to Elaine Pagels. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, well, I grew up in California mm-hmm. in a sort of nominally Christian family, although my father had given it all up for Darwin as soon as he discovered the theory of evolution and decided religion was just for people who were not educated and they didn't know about science. So it was very condescending and kind of a snobbish attitude. And, but I loved most of all stories, poems, music, dance, and especially poems, stories, music, and dance that had to do with what I call a spiritual dimension. It could be Christian, it could be a, a bar mitzvah with amazing singing by a, a cantor in a synagogue. It could be a Hopi dances on the reservations. Not that I participate equally in those because Christianity is my cultural context. Your home, yeah. <laughs> and it's where my home and it's where I um, engage the most and where I struggle the most with questions about it. Mm. Um, and When I was about 14, I was taken to a Billy Graham crusade without knowing much about what it was. Hmm. And it was absolutely stunning. Hmm. I thought the preacher was amazing. Uh, He spoke about America in a way I'd never heard anyone talk about it Hmm. as a country that had used hydrogen bombs to destroy hundreds of thousands of people in Japan and uh, a country that had segregation and slavery. I mean, my parents were very patriotic, so I'd never heard anyone speak that way. Sure. As a kind of prophet, he was quoting the prophet Isaiah, Mm. saying, ah, sinful nation. I think, what? (laughs) That was very interesting. (laughs) Startled me. And then he (laughs) gave the altar call and said, you know, you can be born again and become a new person. And I was 14, and I thought, that sounds irresistible yeah yeah, you know yeah you want a new life you want independence at that age it's a great age to be converted actually sure so i just absolutely loved it i went down and had the altar call and it was and got very much involved in an evangelical group for about a year Hmm. um it was very compelling and it opened up it it opened up the world to me it was like Hmm. i lived in a one-dimensional flat earth (laughs) with no depth in it but this sort of gave a spiritual dimension to it yeah and that was powerful yeah you put on those like 3d glasses and all of a sudden (laughs) yeah and uh it it is it's 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 like your your life can it can live on a much larger canvas yeah yeah and now and now what do you what do you do like where is your life now well I, I left that group at a certain point mm-hmm. out of deep disappointment with an event that contradicted what I had loved about it. Sure. Uh, I'd been told it was about the love of God. Mm-hmm. And when a high school friend of mine was killed in an automobile accident um, and, and I went back to my evangelical friends, they said, well, that's terrible. I mean, was he born again? And I said, no, he was Jewish. And they sort of looked at me and said, 
well, then he's in hell. And I just felt like I'd been hit in the stomach. And yeah. I was so stunned and saddened. I just walked out of there and never went back. Yeah. But years later, I kept thinking there's something there that was very important, very powerful. Hmm. Was it Christianity? Was it religion? Could it have been any religion? I didn't know. Something, yeah. So I went back to graduate school to find out what do we really know about Jesus? Hmm. How do we know? How did this movement start anyway? And how did it become what it became? And to my real astonishment, the professors where I went to graduate school were looking at a whole secret library of gospels that I'd never heard about. Mm. We, we called them the Gnostic gospels because we didn't know what to call them. They just weren't the New Testament gospels. Although there are enormous amounts of overlap with the gospels of Matthew and Luke and John. Mm. But they were not in the New Testament canon as we have it now. And some of them spoke to me very deeply. One of them is the Gospel of Thomas. And half of that, it's only, it's only 14 pages. Mm. And it's not meant to replace the other Gospels, Glenn. It's meant to be a amplification mm, like of a what supplement. you find there. Yeah, like a supplement? Yes, mm. an addition. Mm -hmm. Because the Gospels of the New Testament as you know, they offer the public teaching of Jesus. You know, Jesus is outdoors and there are thousands of people and he speaks. And some of the things he said were written down by people who probably worked hard to remember them. Sure. And then later wrote them down. Yeah. And they're in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, mm -hmm. Matthew 5. Sermon on the Mount in Luke 6 and 7. Mm -hmm. um, very famous teaching, very important teaching. But these other Gospels claim to be what Jesus didn't preach in public. Mm. They claim to tell you what he said in private when he was alone with his disciples. Mm. And Mark says in chapter 4 that when he was alone with his disciples, he spoke to them and only to them about the mystery of the kingdom of God. Mm. but Mark really doesn't tell you what that means. Mark just says, well, he only spoke to outsiders in parables and Mark gives you mainly parables. Sure. And this, this, some of these other sources claim to give you secret teaching. Yeah. We don't really know if they do, yeah. but the gospel of Thomas struck me very deeply. Mm. Yeah. That seems to be the one that's the most, it's like the odd one because I, when I first heard about it, I was expecting stories, like you said, and then you, you open it up and it's just all these sayings. And a lot of them are very familiar because a lot of them are found in the gospels I'm familiar with, but some of them are not. Uh, but I had a friend who said to me, um, you know, when you start reading some of the Gnostic texts, like you'll know the voice of the shepherd in the text, like something like when, when you're reading it and something strikes you as, oh, this is something that Jesus most certainly would say. Like you'll just know it in your spirit if that's if that's part of your past yeah well actually half there's only in that in thomas it's just a list of 140 14 sayings sure and half of them are almost identical with what you find in the sermon on the mount mm -hmm. in matthew and the sermon on the plain in luke um the other half are other kinds of sayings and mm -hmm. i felt yeah. deeply affected by them particularly the one in which Jesus says, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. Mm. What you do not bring forth within you, what you do, um, uh, what you do not bring forth um, will just des could destroy you. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, I'll start over. <laughs> if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. Um, if you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And I took that as a psychological statement mm -hmm. because I think it has truth on that level. And later I came to see it was a theological statement mm. about all of us being created in the image of God, as Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says. Yeah. God creates humankind in his image. And it speaks about the image of God, not as a 
physical phenomena, but as sure. a kind of energy that could only be described in a metaphor as light, mm. which which has a which is sort of visible and yet it's it's a spiritual energy. Sure, sure. Yeah. And so, you know, it's a very powerful gospel, and I thought it was consistent with the teachings I'd found in the others. And mm. yet it goes uh, to another level, it seemed to me. And and so, but many people said, well, wait a minute, these gospels aren't in the New Testament. This has got to be garbage. <laughs> and and some people That's what I was taught. <laughs> we, well, you were taught that my my writings were dangerous. Well, they were they were because yep. um if you if you insist that Jesus said nothing that isn't in the New Testament, well. Mm -hmm. The Gospel of John says Jesus said many th things that weren't in the New Testament, That's right? <laughs> but they weren't all written down. <laughs> yeah. Um, the world would not contain all of the books it would take. Well, that could be a little exaggeration, but nevertheless, the point is there was a lot else. Yeah. yeah. And so we don't know, yeah. but they did speak to me very deeply. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm asking some questions about um the gnostics we, we've already used that that word and i find this term to be very very confusing because i grew up hearing that basically the gnostics were this evil group of people because they were bent on leading christians away from the true orthodox yeah. christianity that was handed down from jesus and the apostles but you know then i i finished i got out of seminary and i started to do my own study your work uh david Brackey. Uh, Bart Ehrman, Karen King, and others. And I discovered that various scholars seem to have various ideas about who the Gnostics were, um, what Gnosticism is, and what Gnosticism entails. Like, there seems to be a lot of ambiguity around this, this topic. So I was wondering if you could help us maybe get our feet a little bit wet in this topic. Like, for you, who were the Gnostics, and what does the term Gnosticism entail? Well, it's a really tough question, as you know, mm. because like you, I mean, I was told the Gnostic Gospels, that means they're the bad ones, right? Right, the bad ones, exactly. Um, <laughs> and the ones that are that don't belong, and they're, they're yeah. obviously fake. The word in Greek means, gnosis means insight. Mm -hmm. And when you read second century fathers of the church, like Clement of Alexandria, um, who's one of the major fathers of the Christian church, um, he uses the term Gnostic to mean a Christian with, with especially deeper insight. Mm -hmm. And that's the way the term was used in the second century. But later it was taken by people who disliked any of these claims to secret teaching mm -hmm. as a very pejorative word. So they intended to tell you it's dangerous, it's wrong, it's heresy. It's, it's, uh, it's leading you astray. Now, heresy, the Greek word means choice. There's nothing really wrong with choice from some points of view. Yeah. But some of the bishops didn't want people to have choice. They wanted to say, what we tell you is absolutely the truth, and that's it. You have no choice about it's it. It's our way or the highway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's the way many Christians see their convictions. Yeah. Many Muslims do, mm -hmm. Orthodox Jews. Orthodox means straight thinking. Mm. I always compare it with orthodontia, which means straight teeth. But right. straight <laughs> thinking means you have to think the way we do. And what they meant by straight thinking is what the church teaches publicly. And that nothing considered private teaching was accepted by certain fathers of the church because you can't really verify it mm -hmm. yeah. from several sources, which is a, a way of trying to figure out if something is a verifiable saying, you know? Mm. So it is hard to verify. Yeah. I feel and like you're a, kind like of a, on your own trying to interpret it. Yeah, because I feel like every book I pick up, it describes it in a different way. Like there's some that describe it as it's one small branch of Christianity. There's many other branches. Others kind of talk about it as it's this 
almost like this umbrella term for a whole bunch of different branches. And some say we should get rid of the term altogether. So like I was opening up books, hoping to find a single answer. And instead I got a whole bunch of different answers. <laughs> what you're getting are sequential answers because Gnostic from the second century to the 20th pretty mm -hmm. much meant don't read this stuff. <laughs> right, stay away. <laughs> but when we found these other texts, mm -hmm. they weren't called Gnostics. They didn't call themselves that. Um, and and Karen King began to look at, and, and also Michael Williams at the University of Seattle mm -hmm. began to look at these and say, wait a minute, the term Gnosticism was made up in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. These people didn't call themselves Gnostics, they called themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. um, but it becomes a negative word when people are trying to narrow down which books you're supposed to read and which books you're supposed to throw away. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Glenn, if you look at Jewish tradition, mm -hmm. Hindu tradition, Buddhist tradition, um, any religious tradition you you consider, there would be uh, an exoteric version for for the primary things you learn first, and there would be an esoteric tradition. in In Judaism, it's Kabbalah, the mystical tradition. In Islam, it's sometimes, uh, what do they call it? Uh, is it Sunni? That there are secret traditions. Mm. In Hinduism and Buddhism, in Buddhism, there's Tantra. So these are usually mystical traditions and they're considered advanced level. Mm. And you're not supposed to learn those things until you've been thoroughly schooled in the others. Mm. Because the others are meant for basic teaching about what you believe and about how to act mm -hmm. and that makes sense mm -hmm. these mystical teachings in jewish tradition you're not supposed to read any of that stuff until you're 37 and then presumably and only then if you're a man um so <laughs> by then you're supposed to have enough sense to discriminate right <laughs> um but in christian tradition there was a taboo yeah. on talking about mystical tradition the mm -hmm. orthodox christians like orthodox greek churches mm -hmm. orthodox ethiopic coptic in egypt they speak about secret traditions which say catholic tradition rejected and protestant tradition grows out of that mm -hmm. which has a kind of taboo mm -hmm. on what you think of as mystical teaching I mean, you could have a mystical experience, but if you're in a Catholic church, mm -hmm. it has to agree with the church's teaching mm -hmm. completely. And it, and the clergy will pass on it. Mm -hmm. And the same mm -hmm. is true in Protestant churches. So the trouble with secret teaching is it can be quite diverse and you have to discriminate. Yeah. And orthodoxy was made to sort it out for you. Yeah, and I guess, I guess it would be easy. Like if the church is trying, I'm thinking back like, in the early, early church, when the church is really beginning to form and it becomes, you know, Constantine makes, you know, Christianity, you know, makes it okay in the Roman Empire. And I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it'd be much easier for church leaders and bishops and things like that to really push the exoteric tradition because you can control that. You can control what people do. You can kind of manipulate people to do certain things, but the esoteric gives people maybe too much freedom if they're going to be going internal to do their own discovery. So I would think it'd be easier to build an institution or a system, so to speak, on an exoteric tradition than on an esoteric tradition. Am I on to well, something there? Exactly. And, yeah. and Constantine knew that. I mean, when he became mm. a Christian, he asked his, his right-hand man, the Bishop Eusebius, get me copies of the scriptures. And Eusebius had to sort of figure out which, which ones to use. Right. And he, he chose the ones that were most familiar, mm -hmm. the gospels that were read a great deal. These The gospel of Thomas was also read a great deal, but it claimed to be a secret text. So that was out. Um, and then he said, okay, you know, as you know, all the bishops have to come to my summer palace in Nicaea mm -hmm. and make a decision. What do we believe? Yeah. What are we going to talk about? So they create the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. And then the two people who refused to sign it, I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven, you know, the whole 
creed nine that yards. Catholic, <laughs> Catholics, Lutherans, Episcopalians all use. Yeah. Um, those who refused to sign it were excommunicated, not only from the church, but they were told they'd be in eternal hell. Oh. And, and that's... That's rather the way many Christians have played it ever since. I mean, one bishop who really wanted to preserve a certain Orthodox tradition said, outside the church, there's no salvation. Mm. And that's why it's dangerous to talk about these others, because, well, they're just untested products, so to speak. <laughs> right, right. And some could lead you astray, and, yeah. and, and they're diverse. So there's a problem there. Hmm. But I think many scholars now would say, well, if you want to understand how the early Christian movement developed, excluding those many other sources we now know about gives you only a sort of narrow stream of what Christi the Christian movement was. Sure. Now we, we need to expand it because it's much you, you can embrace Orthodox tradition, but if you know what the other alternatives were, it makes much more sense, actually. Yeah. Hmm. So what happened then? Like, why? I mean, I'm sure you, there's books on this, but what, 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 what happened to these, like, the Gnostic branches? Like, why did Orthodoxy, what was the big reason why Orthodoxy kind of won the race, so to speak? Like, what, what made that start, get such, so much stronger? whereas the others seem to have just disappeared. Well, the orthodox answer to that is because it's true and truth lasts longer. However, there's another way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. When Constantine became a Christian and he found which scriptures to read and he had a, a list of doctrines, he then opened the imperial treasuries of Rome to the bishops of the orthodox church. Mm -hmm. They then built the Vatican, church they built the church of the holy sepulcher in jerusalem they built hagia sophia which means holy wisdom in constantinople mm -hmm. magnificent beautiful churches enormously wealthy mm -hmm. and the others got um no financial support they were um they were blocked in many ways uh their places of worship were confiscated they were mm -hmm. It was complete shutdown on the government's part mm. uh, against the groups that were not part of the Orthodox Church. Mm. So basically, it's like, if I'm hearing you right, it's like, if you don't come in line with this way of understanding or these doctrines, whatever, you don't get the money. We, we cut you off. Well, if you were the Bishop of Egypt, say, yeah. of Alexandria, mm -hmm. as Athanasius was, um, when suddenly you as a Christian are not being persecuted yeah. and, and your life in danger because you're a Christian. Suddenly you're an Orthodox Bishop of Alexandria. You, you have an enormous influx of money mm -hmm. in your treasury and you have all political power. You can be a judge in civil cases. You can be part of the administration. Mm -hmm. It's now the Holy Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So you can become politically powerful in Alexandria, you could be the most powerful man in the entire city and the richest. Mm. But if you're a member of those other groups, you're frozen out, you're, you, you are taxed enormously, mm. uh, and you can be a fugitive. So that's, that's how you encourage orthodoxy. It's yeah. one way. Mm. Wow. That's something that you just don't, I mean, like I said, when I, you know, growing up, I just heard it was orthodoxy was just what was handed down from the apostles and you know the holy what, the holy spirit you know kind of inspired everybody along the way and here we absolutely. are <laughs> that's absolutely. it <laughs> absolutely and and there are other versions of that because yeah <laughs> some of those groups that were excluded for example i mean they would say well these heretics they 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 don't believe in one god they they yeah. have all kinds of weird ideas about they 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 hate the body. Well, that's not the case for a lot of these sources. Yeah. These are just as monotheistic as any others. And some of them are quite consistent with, uh, with Orthodox sources. If you read the Gospel of Thomas, along with Matthew, mm -hmm. along with Mark, along with Luke, you can see them as, a, as, as an expansion 
of your access to teachings of Jesus. Yeah. And they're not contradictory. Mm. But uh, there are some texts, because it's a very mixed collection, mm. they're not all Gospels at all. Um, some are texts of people who said that have revelations that are different. Mm -hmm. um, some of these texts are different. Mm. But anyway, the Orthodox Church just said basically, don't touch any of that stuff. It's just too, um, it raises too many questions. And yeah. one famous father of the church, one of my favorites, Tertullian said, well, just don't ask questions. Question, <laughs> questions are what make people heretics, he said. Yeah, right. He would questions hate this podcast. <laughs> he would hate this podcast. Questions are dangerous. Yeah. Well, he, would, he, he wouldn't approve of you at all. No. <laughs> that's what make people heretics, asking questions like those. Yeah, that's right. So uh, you, you talk about how these, these texts that were considered dangerous. So one of the big ones um, that's really recently come to my attention is the Gospel of Judas. And uh, you wrote a book with, with Karen King about this. And if I'm not mistaken, the Gospel of Judas is a relatively new find, right? A relatively new discovery in the 2000s. Am I correct on that? Was it found? was well, a or made available, I should say. Yes, because we knew there was a text called that. Yeah. As early as a hundred years after the death of Jesus, approximately. Mm. But somebody called something the gospel of judas or the gospel of thomas or the gospel of philip or the gospel of mary magdalene we didn't know what they were right um but only fragments of that were discovered and came to light in 2005 and after Got it. and i was part of a team and so was bart Ehrman and karen king and others that the national geographic who bought this text um probably bought illegally on the on the uh black market mm. because i don't think national geographic did it illegally they were told something different sure but anyway um that came on the market now the gospel of judas is a is a gospel that suggests that jesus himself who appears in the gospel is critical of the 12 apostles mm. because they're encouraging martyrdom mm. they're encouraging you if you have children not to prevent your children for, from getting killed because they're Christians. I couldn't help thinking, Glenn, about Muslim parents who might be told by some imams, radical imams, that your 15-year-old should put on a suicide vest and, and, and become a martyr because that's what God wants. And, you know, and, and some people would say, well, all right, if that's what God wants. And, and when those young people go into a market and blow themselves up and kill 20 people, their lives, their families are not to mourn. They're supposed to celebrate. They get money from, from the group that supports this. Mm. That happens today, right? Yeah. But this was a, that was a text that I think was a concerned about bishops encouraging young people to get martyred. Mm. And it's probably a late text. And it pictures the 12 apostles, some of whom, of course, did die as martyrs, yeah. um, encouraging that. I don't think it's a very interesting text, mm -hmm. um, spiritually speaking. Mm -hmm. I think it had a purpose at the time. Mm. So it's important to read it in the context that it was like, what was going, what, what was the big question, I guess, in the yeah. year at the time? Yeah. I mean, that's as close as Karen King and I could come sure. to what was going on in the mind of the writers. Mm -hmm. It wasn't written by Judas Iscariot, but then, you know, none of the gospels that we know, we don't know who wrote them actually. They're, you know, the titles aren't meant to be author. This, mm -hmm. the gospel according to Matthew could be, Matthew is your teacher. And so you say, well, this is what our teacher taught. Right. This is the gospel as Matthew taught it. This is mm -hmm. the gospel as Luke taught it. And they have variations, as you know, but they're not, they're not totally different. You could equally take the gospel as Thomas heard it from Jesus. Mm. Um, and that particular gospel, as I say, I go back to that one because I find it uh, deeply congruent with the teachings of the gospels in the new testament mm. and yet it goes further but 
just as you say, what makes it offensive to Orthodox Christians and bishops who are trying to control the flow of information mm -hmm. and say, this is the church, this is the only way, just believe what we tell you, um, is this, the idea that what you find within yourself uh, is a connection with God because you're created in his image. Mm. And therefore you can, you can find your way back to God by seeking within yourself. Yeah. Um, and that is a teaching that bishops don't like because they mm. want to be in control of the message. Yeah. yeah. And it means you can kind of freelance mm. spiritually mm. and find your way back to God. That is not a message that a leader of any church or most churches would endorse. Yeah. And that's, it's so funny. Cause like, I feel like I'm on this journey now where I'm on this, in this place of self discovery. And I feel like I've, I've looked inside a lot to really ask myself, what has my experience with God taught me about God? Yeah. And a lot of that stuff has taken me in places that uh, are much different than how I was raised in a very conservative evangelical tradition. And that's received a lot of the, a lot of the kickback. But in these, in this time that I'm in, I feel almost closer to God than like I've ever felt before. Like I feel like I've evolved to places with God that I just, I, I just, I didn't have access to when I was just going by the book, so to speak. Like I was just trying to stay in line with the boundaries and stay in line with the certain things I was allowed to read and wasn't allowed to read and was allowed to think about, not allowed to think about. And now that I've kind of it blew up that box, <laughs> so to speak, uh, it's just taken me to these wonderful places. Yeah. Well, actually, Glenn, that is the experience of many people. And when I encountered the Gospel of Thomas, I've, and many people have said to me, now I can really be a Christian mm. because it's not just a matter of believing. Yes a bunch of statements in a creed because these texts are not so much about what do you believe do you believe in god do you believe that jesus is the son of god do you believe that jesus was born of a virgin it's not yeah. those aren't the questions the question is what is your experience who are you uh, how do you understand who you are do you sense a connection with a divine uh, source and that's what you're talking about now, you know, and I know, and everybody knows that some people say, well, I hear the voice of God and it told me to kill my family. Mm. You know, I mean, there are people who claim revelation for atrocious acts, mm. right? Yeah. And so that's why it is, it's not without risk. Yeah. It is, like to you said, look it, at it, these it, other sources. Yeah, it is dangerous. Like you said, it is dangerous. I think you said in the email, it is dangerous. Your work. I said it's dangerous, it and that's why it matters. Because, that's why it matters. Yeah. Because it opens up. Yeah. It can open you to your own experience, but there are people for whom that can be dangerous. Yeah. And wow. and yet, for so many others, it means that I can love the Christian tradition in a way that I couldn't if I thought it was limited to that narrow stream that calls itself Orthodox. Mm. I go to a wonderful Episcopal church, which I love, which says the creed and follows the traditions. Mm. Um, these traditions are inherently conservative. Mm. I love a lot about that church, um, but it's not closed yeah. to these other sources as I understand it. But there are many churches that are and that people are genuinely afraid mm. of going out of the boundaries, right? Because mm. um, there are unknown territories and dragons and, yeah. and they, they, they drag you down into hell. I mean, that's the kind of threat that's been part of the tradition forever. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard a lot of those, <laughs> a lot of those threats for sure. Um, so how is this like, you talk about how you said in the email exchange that we had that you speak of these things not as an outsider, but as a participant. And I think that's super fascinating to me because a lot of the people that I have come across in these conversations are on the outside. Maybe they were part of the faith, they left the faith. Now they just kind of look at this strictly in a historical way. But I think that you're so unique because especially reading like your memoir and things like that, you really look at it from a very personal place. And it seems like it's really formed 
your faith. So I'm curious, like, what are some of the bigger things that your personal work and study in the Gnostics and Gnosticism and the texts, what are some specific ways that your faith has been formed or deepened as a result of your own personal study? Well, I've put the word Gnosticism aside and just, I talk about other Christian gospels Mm -hmm. and some of them I find very powerful and compelling and others not. And I'm sure you would find that too. If you look at all of those texts from that were found with these sources, um, they're not of equal value, it seems to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of them do speak, and they you can see, for example, why the Gospel of Mary Magdalene would be um, shunned by Orthodox teachers because they haven't allowed women to have positions of preaching or teaching within Christian churches for nearly yeah. 2,000 years. And the idea that Mary Magdalene might have been such a person had to be rejected now, what would we ever do? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, you know, in that text, um, Peter says, well, I don't believe Jesus ever spoke to her this way. I think she's just talking strange ideas. And she says, my brother, Peter, do you think I just made this up? Do you think I'm just lying about the Lord? Mm-hmm. And he basically does. And the others say, Peter, you always get angry. Just stop it. <laughs> and, and, she goes out to become an evangelist with them. And that is why it's not in the New Testament. But so that has changed my view about women in the early Christian movement. Um, But more deeply, it, it suggests that spiritual life is, is not simple. It's not easy. It's good to have guidance about how to start. And that's what the Orthodox tradition was meant to do. And what that's what, regular tradition does for jews and muslims and buddhists it gives you Mm -hmm. guidelines okay you need guidelines sure but then they stop and say okay now stop (laughs) as you know one of the heresy hunters says well if you found the faith what else do you need just stop (laughs) stop asking questions right there we've got the answers just yeah stop yeah but these encourage you to keep on a spiritual search because it is hard and there is more to discover. Yeah. And I find that very compelling. And what it does to me is what it's done to you. It leads you into your own questions and your own experiences to say, what is valid for you? That's right. What, what really deeply resonates is true. And mm-hmm. some of these sources deeply do. Mm-hmm. And I feel they, they are enhancing and, and, and deepening what I understand about the faith, but that it's not just belief. It's more about experience. See, gnosis is not not about believing. Believing is beginning Mm -hmm. on the path. Gnosis is about insight, Hmm. which means that's what happens to you as you develop spiritually. So it's it's meant to be a different level and it's not for beginners. Mm -hmm. So you begin in one place but then you go a little bit deeper. You can yeah. go further. And yeah. it's meant, just as in Jewish tradition, you don't start with mystical tradition. Mm-hmm. You start with, with uh, dietary laws and sexual laws and, <laughs> and, and basic beliefs. The Lord, your God is one God. I mean, and then later, maybe you go into these very powerful sources that can lead you into very different kinds of spiritual experience yeah Yeah. but it's so that's what i think is possible and i think it's the other thing glenn is that so many people like you and like me feel they have to leave christianity because it tries to put blinders on them or tell them what questions they should never ask right i've heard people say my minister said, don't ever ask questions like that. <laughs> or no, you know, you can't read that sort of thing. That's yeah. dangerous. So when they have that experience, they say, okay, well, Christianity is just a bunch of things that the church makes you, tells you you have to believe. Yeah. I, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah. Um, my father left it because he felt that it was contrary to, um, to science. Mm. And of course it's not. But 
but it, but what he was dealing with was a kind of church that would not allow him sure. to think about Darwin or yeah. scientific discovery. Yeah. So, and and that's to me a tremendous loss because I can't now imagine living without a spiritual dimension in my life, especially because of the events that I wrote about in that book. Yeah. yeah. Without a spiritual dimension. I mean, I, I feel I would feel unmoored. And I, many people I know, yeah. most of my colleagues in the university have no use for what you're calling a spiritual dimension or what I'm calling a spiritual. But they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. What, why, who needs that? Yeah. Religion is for people who have to have a bunch of answers thrown at them for things that are hard to understand. Yeah. Um, it's like we have the system, we have the answers, we have every, why do you need this? Why do you need that? Yeah. Over there, yeah. And, and, and a lot of people will say, well, that's pretty limiting, you know? Yeah. And so they just reject the whole thing. And I yeah. think that's a great loss. So Amen. that's why I think opening up these sources and saying, well, take a look at them. You don't have to accept them. You can say, no, I don't. That one sounds wrong to me. Right. Um, this one, this one sounds right. When I yeah. read one that talks about Jesus, as it's called, um, they, they, one of the texts calls Jesus a psychiatrist, but in, in Greek, mm. Suke iatros means a healer of the soul. Hmm. And he gives medicine to heal hearts. Hmm. You've seen the image of Jesus there. It's, he's a physician yeah. um, with medication to heal your heart. Hmm. Now, I find that a very powerful image. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what psychiatrists are supposed to do, but they really can't. They stop sure. short of that very often. <laughs> they could give you maybe medications, but healing the heart is another matter yeah and that's what spiritual teachers claim to do some some might be able to help mm -hmm. and others may really lead you astray mm. yeah so wow. Wow. it takes discernment and that's hard mm. discernment of in the early church they talked about the problem of discernment of spirits mm -hmm. that is they asked spiritual masters how do you know when a vision is from god or when it's leading you astray, when it's from Satan. And one of the great spiritual teachers, Anthony of Egypt, said, well, a demonic spirit may, may look wonderful at first, mm -hmm. but after a while it will leave you depressed and anxious and fearful. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a spirit from God may terrify you at first, but later it will bring you calm and peace in your, in your soul. And he said, that's how you can tell what is from God and what is not. Hmm. Wow. That's interesting. I was thinking of that parallel in relation to a lot of these texts, because some of the times there, it is terrifying. Like when I first opened up some of these, some of these texts, I was like, my goodness, you know, like uh, what, what am I reading? And then to your point, there is a sense of peace that oftentimes comes a little bit later. Yeah. Well, the Gospel of Thomas opens by saying, let the person who's seeking not stop seeking until he finds. When he finds, he'll be astonished and troubled. Troubled. Yeah. 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 And and then he will come to 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 be master of it. Yeah. I mean, then he will come to a place of uh acceptance and understanding yeah after being troubled and disturbed mm -hmm. yeah. but not without that and and some people get very unnerved by the deep waters of spiritual exploration and and rightly so yeah we want to avoid all the i mean we like to avoid those things because we want the very simple we want to be able to follow the path and know where we're going and have the answers and it's a sense of comfort. And I think when you encounter these internal things, these esoteric things, like you said before, it can be very unnerving because you don't know where it's going to lead you. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think that answer of St. Anthony um, 
has some truth in it that mm -hmm. you can be troubled at first and anxious and unsettled and unnerved. And then eventually it brings you to a place of greater resolution in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, or not. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So last question for you, because um, I, I don't want to keep you too long because I know you, you have a life you have to go and <laughs> you have a lot of things to do. Oh, and, and let me just say too that yeah. this has allowed me to enjoy and love participating in my church mm. because I don't feel confined by it mm. as I did in that church where they gave me an answer that so sounded to me contrary to what what they always talked about, the love of God. Yeah. I think that's something that's freeing for people because, I mean, I even think of the listeners of this podcast, like a lot of them, I haven't been to church in a long, long time, uh, just because of that. Part of it's that very reason that just questions are not welcomed. And when you start to think outside of the certain boundaries that are set up for you, you know, you're frowned upon. And I just, I experienced, that was so much of my experience for so long. I just felt like I needed a break from that. But I think that going back to church, I think, would be thinking about what you're talking about with this and just, you know, I feel like it's just, it, it gives more freedom to operate within the institution that feels like it hurt me for so many years. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm trying to piece together what I'm trying to say here, but I feel like a lot of what you're saying gives me more freedom to step back into the institution with a much different perspective than I had when I came out of it. Well, it makes a lot of sense because many students, even at Princeton, say, well, if I take a course in, er in early Christianity and I learn that, say, the Gospels weren't all written at the same time and they weren't dictated by an angel, <laughs> uh, they were written by people, um, then, then I realize that they're not important anymore. I'll lose my yeah. faith. Yeah. Um, and they realize after they study this that very often the opposite is true. Mm. Some people do opt out and some scholars do and they say well you see that's just because people in churches are just naive and and, and afraid uh, they want somebody to tell them all the answers but some other people see it quite differently and most of my students understand if you're not hostile to the to Christianity you're not trying to debunk it yeah um you're trying to open it up yeah yeah and that's what these texts were originally for yeah yeah, that's really good. So last question for you. Um, most of our listeners, a lot of our listeners are brought up in the conservative evangelical world. They're in this place, like I said, before we hit record, they're deconstructing, they're asking a lot of questions. They don't want to leave the faith, but they're rethinking the faith, the Bible, the right. cross, the atonement, all the things. And a lot of them have come up against some really harsh uh, kickback critique from their former tribe. Many have been outcasted altogether. So my question is, like, I'm sure that you've experienced that kickback. I, I imagine, and I've, I've read some articles of people's critique against your work. Oh, yes. and, yeah, like, I, I know you've been called heretic, blasphemer, things like that. But what is your advice for the person who's in that place where they're, they're trying to be a good steward of their spiritual journey? They're trying to widen the scope of their reading, the scope of their understanding, break through those, those boundaries that have been set up for them but they're coming against that kickback and everything in them wants to stop. But at the same time, everything in them wants to keep going. <laughs> what is your, what is your advice to that, that person? Well, that's, that's a good question. And you're right. I mean, somebody told me that on some websites, I'm called Elaine Pagan. Um, and they just, they just think that one of them, who's a respected New Testament professor in Atlanta basically said, my mission is to destroy the church. And I thought, that's so ignorant. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just seems to me that it's useful to see to what extent your own feelings are validated and talk to people you can trust who aren't going to say, well, you know, you're going to go to hell <laughs> um, if you read that, because there's nothing in the teachings of Jesus that talks that way at all. Right. No. Is there? No. Nothing. No. I mean, the creed, you know, there were 300 years of a very vibrant early Christian community 
before there was a creed and before there was a, a New Testament that was closed. They didn't have a creed. They didn't have a New Testament. It was called the way. The Christian movement was called not a church. Well, ecclesia means an assembly, but it was called the way, hados in Greek, a path. Mm. And it was a path of experience that you, on which you can explore and test and, and go slowly if you want. Yeah. Really and and I, I would think only speak to people whose intuition seems to you sound and wise and and that you trust. Um, and some of them may be appalled that you're reading things they think you shouldn't read and they're very well meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and they're doing the best they can, but they may have different spiritual needs than than others. Yeah. I think people are very different. Do you, you know the book of William James, The Varieties of Religious Experience? I haven't heard of it, no. You've heard of it? Oh. I haven't, no. Yeah, I'm going to write it oh. down. What was it again? Well, read <laughs> it. Yeah. This is a very famous book by William James. William James was a psychologist. He was the brother of the writer Henry James. Um, he was in 1910, 1912, he was a psychologist, brought up Christian, and he fell into a very deep depression at one point when he was young. And he said he just didn't know how people could go on living, being aware of death and being aware of annihilation and the, and, and the, the darkness in the world. And he came out of the depression by holding on to sayings he'd learned, like the Lord is my refuge. He said it was like being in the ocean and you're about to drown. And he was holding on to these phrases like logs that keep him afloat. The Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my refuge in a time of trouble. And he said he came out of the depression. And after that, he, he wrote a book about called The Varieties of Religious Experience talking about the fact that people have different spiritual needs and different ways of approaching a spiritual life. Some follow the way of Catholic saints. Some like the way of, of people who spontaneously have religious experience. That book is so powerful. Um, and he disguises his own experience in it. He doesn't admit that he had a mental breakdown. But he came to understand that there are many ways of experiencing conversion and spiritual life. Yeah. And it's a, it's a very important book. Um, another one that I like very much is the one by, um, is the one called uh, How God Becomes Real by Tanya Lerman anthropologist so these are about spiritual experience and yeah. and i think exploring those is very important yeah that's good that gives gives a lot of freedom that cuts off a lot of the a lot of change people feel elaine so hey thank you so much this has been amazing uh but we are just about out of time and uh, okay. i wish we weren't because i could talk to you literally all day so maybe maybe we could do this again sometime i would really like that <laughs> I would enjoy that too, Glenn. Thank Good you. Talking to you. Yeah, and real quick, uh, where can people go? What's the best place to go to interact with you and your work online? Any anywhere in particular? Well, I, you know, I have not really done social media much because I get so many, so much email, but I often do respond to people on email. You responded and, to me. <laughs> yeah, and I do because it matters to me when people are seeking. I mean, I'd be happy to talk to a lot of people, or just I'm going to write another book. Um, which is about Jesus. What do we know? Mm. And what don't, what don't we know about Jesus of Nazareth? Mm. How do we know what we think we know? Um, and how is it that there are so many different ways of understanding who Jesus was? Yeah. And then I, I hope to do a podcast or something like it. I just, I'm not tech savvy enough to do it yet, but, <laughs> but I would like to do something like that. Well, I think we that would do be it together. <laughs> I think that would be wonderful. I'd be more than happy to do it with you. <laughs> well, you know, that's that that might be something to actually consider. 
There you go. Well, email me. <laughs> we'll figure it out for sure. All right, Elaine. Well, I'm going to uh, end our recording here, but this has right. been a lot of fun. And uh, thank you so much. Good talking with you.